So we're delighted today to have our speaker, uh, Brian Metzger uh, from Columbia. Brian is a uh, premier astrophysicist and has worked on a ton of different problems. Um, he's going to talk today about kilonovae, but he's worked on the reception events and novae and FRBs and anything else you can think of related to astrophysics. Um, so Brian is just here today. Uh, I think he has still a few slots open in the late afternoon if you wanted to meet with him, uh, and one or two slots open for dinner. So please let me know if you're interested in either of those things. And Brian, take it away. Great. It's great to be here. I was here in the spring and talked about uh, Kilanova, and I thought when I was invited to follow, this is great because I always go to Harvard and talk about Kilanova, I'll be able to talk about something else. Um, <laughs> even I think this is all I work on, uh, and, and fortunately then this event happened, or fortunately, uh, which I, there's no way I could not talk about uh, this, this uh, LIGO binary neutron star merger. But I'm sure you've heard uh, some of this from Ido. Um, uh, today I'm going to focus a little bit on the thermal emission, the kilonova aspect of this, uh, and what it's telling us about this uh, exciting uh, discovery. I just want to highlight my collaborators, particularly the work I've done with uh, Ido's group and the observational side of things, uh, has really forged, I think, our, our joint interpretation of this event. And, um, and one of the things I'm going to get across is I, there are definitely some mysteries, some things we're trying to work out, but I, I think this event was actually surprisingly well behaved in terms of some of the gen general things we expected. Um, and, and, but, but that's actually very important because it means that we can say some things with confidence about the properties of neutron stars, about the origin of the heavy elements in the universe. Um, okay, um, so I don't have to review binary neutron stars, I just want to point out that this was one of the main motivations for LIGO even before the discovery of binary black holes, and these things do exist in our galaxy, the holes taylor pulsar will you know, merge through gravitational waves in about 300 million years. Um, and the idea was that you could detect these you know, for very, very many cycles in the LIGO band. And then this particular discovery, the neutron star, was, I think, in band for you know, several minutes, actually, uh, prior to, to the merger. Um, uh, and, uh, and so you know, we had this amazing event that was you know, first detected by LIGO and Virgo. Uh, and then it was uh, uh, also, actually, within a few seconds, uh, detected by Fermi GBM, an integral in the two air regions on the sky uh, coincided. The nice thing about having Virgo online was, of course, it reduced this fairly large uh, banana into this more manageable one of 30 square degrees, which allowed uh, optical follow-up observations uh, several hours later, which discovered this uh, fading optical counterpart, which enabled us to identify the galaxy at a distance of about 40 megaparsecs. The chirp mass of the binary, this is so, I'm just sort of breezing through the gravitational wave side of things, but the chirp mass was of course very well determined. The individual mass of the binaries, uh, under the reasonable approximations, the neutron stars were not spinning extremely rapidly, uh, are reasonably well constrained, but not perfectly so. The first one between about 1.4 and 1.6, and the other between about 1.2 and 1.4. But I want to emphasize that you can actually rule out the possibility this could have been equal mass binary mer merger. Um, one thing I was surprised was of how well the total mass of the binary was constrained uh, by LIGO to be you know, within this fairly narrow range. Uh, and that will play an important story in what I say later about the equation of state of the neutron star. Um, so there's, an, there's a degeneracy with the gravitational waves. If you have a face-on merger, uh, it's more powerful in gravitational waves, so it's further away. If you have an edge-on one, it's closer. So the gravitational wave distance was rather uncertain, but once you knew the distance from the galaxy, that actually broke to some extent that degeneracy, and so you're able to infer that the viewing angle of the binary, it was actually spiraling away from us, this angle of momentum vector was into the, into the sky, uh, and, and, but, but probably misaligned by up to, say, 30 degrees with respect to the uh, angle of momentum axis. It's possible it was based on, based on the gravitational waves alone, but we don't think that's likely. So there was this amazing electromagnetic follow-up campaign. Uh, so this just shows the different wavelengths of emission as a function of time after the uh, merger. Each of these ticks represents an observation, either a detection or an upper limit that was made. So after you know, the gravitational waves, and then within a few seconds, there was a arrival of, of a gamma ray burst. Um, within about 11 hours, it was happening over the Indian Ocean or something, so it, the big telescopes in Chile had to wait about 11 hours for it to rise, and then it was you know, simultaneously discovered by, by these several groups. Um, uh, then it was actually, this event was actually very close compared to what we expected. I didn't think we would have one that we'd be able to get spectra of, uh, but there were optical and infrared spectra taken over several weeks. It was initially not detected 
in the radio or x-rays uh, within a few days, but about two weeks later it rose in the x-rays and about the same time rose in the radio. So it really was this multi-wavelength uh, event, really just spectacular that had all these counterparts, and I'm going to spend a little time on packaging things. I think you, you've heard some, some explanations for what we saw, but I first want to just go into a little bit about what we expect uh, binary neutron star mergers uh, to, to produce. Um, so the outcome of neutron star merger depends sensitively on two things. One is the total mass of the binary, which as I said, LIGO measured quite well. And the other is the maximum mass, the stable mass that a neutron star can support due to its internal pressure, uh, due to nuclear forces. Um, and so what happens is if you have a fairly low mass binary, or sorry, high mass binary, the two objects merge and you essentially immediately collapse into a black hole. More likely is that you form an object which is uh, temporarily stabilized by the fact that it's rotating very rapidly. So it's like rotating sort of peanut-like structure, so-called hypermassive neutron star. And it's supported only so far as it's differentially rotating. And we expect that that differential rotation will be removed by internal stresses like magnetic stresses or gravitational waves. And very quickly, within a few tens or hundreds of milliseconds, we'd expect it to collapse to a black hole. But because the outer layers of the star possess so much angular momentum, you form uh, an accretion disk around the black hole. It's even possible that if you have a very low mass binary, or the maximum mass of a neutron star is very high, that when you merge, even once the differential rotation is removed and you have a solid body rotating neutron star, that it still doesn't want to collapse into a black hole. And is temporarily stabilized and has to spin down in, in a sort of secular fashion before collapsing, or maybe even indefinitely stable. Um, you can get, and I just want to say that I think in this event, with the case we would have made, because I think we likely went through this channel. Uh, we wouldn't have seen as bright a kilonova if we promptly collapsed to a black hole. We would have seen more fireworks if we produced a stable neutron star. So I think we went through this channel. Uh, Brian, yeah. Wouldn't that be not uh, emit a lot of rotation waves? It does, it does, and that's something that, but it happens at high frequencies, and where light was not very sensitive. So in a future event, we might be able to see that emission, but not with this one, unfortunately. We couldn't constrain. So all LIGO sees is the in-spiral, and then it goes out of their band, and we don't, they don't really know what happened. But electromagnetically, they can see what we think happened. Uh, I just want to say LIGO did, has not yet, at least uh, as has been announced, to the, my knowledge, detected a neutron star black hole system. Um, but you can get qualitatively similar outcome. If the black hole is fairly massive, uh, it will just swallow the neutron star hole. Um, you might get some electromagnetic emission. Uh, Dan, Dan, I think, has looked at this, but it's, it's probably much dimmer. Um, if the black hole is less massive or spinning, it will actually tidally disrupt the neutron star outside of the horizon, and you can, in this case, eject some matter and also form an accretion torus. So you can get qualitatively similar engine from two very different systems, but we haven't uh, seen these events yet. So I'm just going to show you a simulation of two merging, neutrons, two merging neutron stars. This is from David Radice. So you're going to see the final uh, few orbits of the merger. This is right after it's gone out of LIGO's band. Um, you're going to see very strong tidal forces between the two neutron stars as they coalesce. This ejects some material in the equatorial plane of the binary. Um, and then they actually will physically collide and there'll be a, a much larger ejected cloud that's produced uh, from the collision of the two objects. Uh, that, this whole region just gets filled with gas and then you have this rotating peanut in the center which is radiating gravitational waves and eventually it loses that differential rotation and collapses and you still have this sort of torus of material, maybe a tenth of the solar mass surrounding the black hole. And so these accretion disks uh, can be quite, uh, uh, they're, they're fairly modest in size, uh, can be fairly massive, they're very exotic, they're very hot and dense. Um, all of the complex nuclei in the original neutron star are broken down into free neutrons and protons. And they're uh, electron degenerate, and this means that you have weak interactions in the disk, uh, ERCA reactions, which tend to drive it to be very neutron rich. So even if it weren't formed from a neutron star, you have this very neutron rich torus around the black hole. And I think it was even back in the early 90s by Ramesh and others where they basically estimated the accretion time scale of this torus onto the black hole. And it's, for typical parameters, it's about a, a fraction of a second. So you're accreting an enormous amount of mass in a very short period of time. If only a small fraction of that were channeled into a relativistic jet, you could explain the high luminosities of gamma ray bursts. And we have this characteristic time scale, which is similar to the observed durations of short gamma ray bursts. So this has been one of the theoretical motivations for a long time, that this torus black hole structure after the black hole forms could be an engine for short gamma ray bursts. Um, but more generically, you know, what type of counterpart we expect to see from these events is likely to be a strong function of our viewing angle with respect to the binary axis. 
If we happen to be within the opening angle of the GRB jet, we're, we're not sure exactly how the jets form, but that's another issue. Uh, then, you know, internal shocks or reconnection in the jet can produce high, ra high energy radiation, but it will be, be beamed relativistically. Uh, so you only see it if you're within an opening angle. Excuse me, Brian. Um, yeah. In this scenario, um, so a lot, most of the mass is accreted very quickly. You right. have jets. Uh, is there a remnant of the mass that stays around for a while in a corona, for example, that could then more gradually accrete? Or is that epic of possible accretion over? I think, disc yeah, I think the corona will, there'll be a fast, you know, corona there, and the disc will become more corona-like as, as, it, as it accretes. Uh, but I don't expect it to last, you know, extremely long period of time. I mean, there'll be some disc, but it should sort of go away with, with the disc itself. So, mm -hmm. so it's sort of on this few second time scale. So in other words, if we had a really nearby one of these, and we could see accretion at the level of, say, 10 to the 36 or percent. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's actually an interesting question whether at some point, so these disks are, are extremely optically thick to photons, so we can't see them directly at this phase. But if we wait several months, you could imagine that things might turn on as Eddington sources. And so that's something we should be looking at. Uh, in the X-rays, but it takes a, this ejected cloud takes months to become directly transparent until we can actually see the disk. Yeah, but that's what I was looking yeah, at. Yeah, yeah. So, so very late times, time there may be something right. interesting uh -huh. there. Yes. Yeah. Um, so although uh, the GRB we saw was very close, we think most GRBs are cosmological distances, and we have to have some estimate of their volumetric rate. Um, and now from LIGO, we have a rate of binary neutron star mergers, which you can see is much, much higher. Um, it's uncertain by an order of magnitude since we only have one event. So, so you could say, well, maybe only a small fraction of, of mergers produce short GRBs, which seem unlikely, more likely we only see the gamma ray bursts for those which are in the opening angle of the jet. But by comparing these two numbers, you can figure out that the typical half opening angle is about a tenth of a radian. This is similar to what uh, Wenfei and Ino found by modeling the uh, afterglows. Um, so for this event, we're likely, you know, where we, we could have been seeing it after 30 degrees, we're likely two or three times uh, outside of the opening angle of the jet. I mean, so that can partially explain why we saw this very dim uh, gamma ray burst. I don't want to talk much in this talk about the gamma ray burst, but I simply say there is this mystery as to why it was delayed with respect to the GRB, or the, to the merger by a few seconds. This could be because it actually took a, a, some period of time for the black hole to form and the jet to be created. It could be because it takes a while for the jet to escape this cloud of gas that was produced when the neutron stars collided. It could be that the emission happens very far away from the engine and there's actually a finite light travel time delay between the emission site and the direct line of sight from the gravitational waves. Um, there's definitely, this is definitely still an open issue and we're still debating this. Um, we also saw the off-axis, we believe, was potentially the off-axis afterglow. So if we were truly on axis of the jet, we would see its relativistic afterglow as it interacted with the circumstellar medium, even from the very beginning of the burst, but we have rather stringent constraints on the X-rays at early times. But if we're off axis, then initially this uh, relativistic afterglow is beamed out of our line of sight, and only once the jet sweeps up enough ISM to slow down that we enter that, that causal cone will the X-ray radio emission rise, and that is consistent with what we saw where we had upper limits in the X-rays and then it was rising. And if you model what type of off axis jet would be required to explain this data, you can explain it with actually properties of the ISM density and, and GRB energy, which are similar to those we have inferred, you know, and others have inferred for on-axis GRBs, assuming we're, you know, 20 or so degrees, 30 degrees off-axis, okay? And likewise, uh, the, the same with uh, the radio data that we see, at least at early times we don't detect it, uh, but then it brightens. Now, uh, we, of course, continuing to follow this in the radio, it, it may have some hints, but I think we're, or may have some deviations from this, but I think Broadly speaking, we saw something that looked like a short GRB, and we infer something more powerful off-axis that is you know, likely a, 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 a properties consistent with cosmological GRBs. So I think this is very strong evidence that binary neutron star mergers are at least one channel for making short GRBs. What I want to focus on in this talk is the thermal kilonova emission, which is produced by the radioactive decay of this broader, more isotropic ejected cloud, which is produced during the merger. So we're going to so I'll discuss, we synthesize very heavy elements in the injector, and this can power radioactive emission. So I emphasize that the basic idea is that there are several sources of neutron-rich material. There's the tidal tails when the neutron stars are merging. You eject matter in the tidal, uh, in the equatorial plane. This tends to be very neutron-rich, the neutron-to-proton ratio greater than 10. There's also matter produced when the two neutron stars collide. This tends to come out more, uh, somewhat more in the polar region. Um, and it, it, because that region is heated up and because it's irradiated by neutrinos from this hot gas, it tends to, 
to, this tends to turn neutrons back into protons, and, and, and you tend to be not quite as neutron rich in the polar regions. And so this dynamical ejecta can range up to maybe a hundredth of a solar mass. It typically comes out very quickly, and it has a very high velocity, between 0.2 and 0.3 C. But you can also get outflows that happen from the accretion disk that's feeding the black hole after the merger. Um, and as I'll discuss in a second, if the typical torus is a tenth of a solar mass, and, and what we'll show in a second is that actually the black hole is a fussy eater, and it only accretes about 70 or 80 or 60 or 70 percent of the mass. So most of it actually gets blown out in, in outflows from the accretion disk. And this tends to come out somewhat longer time scales, maybe up to a second, and it tends to have a lower velocity because the disk is a more extended structure. Um, and in this case, the composition can be either very neutron rich or maybe uh, less neutron rich, uh, depending actually mostly on the lifetime of the central neutron star before a black hole forms. I'll come back to this in a second. So let's say we, with my student, uh, or sorry, with postdoc uh, Daniel Siegel, Einstein Fellow at Columbia, we performed the first uh, 3D GRMHD simulations of these post-merger accretion disks. So we basically set up a torus similar to those that are produced in the merger. We just follow its accretion onto the black hole. Um, and what we find, uh, just in, in words, uh, is what you might expect. So the, the, the energy released by uh, the, the MRI in the midplane tends to to dissipate a lot of that rotational energy in the coronal regions, which get very hot and extended, and this tends to uh, evaporate and cause an outflow. And the midplane of the disk is very neutron rich, um, it's, but the outflows can be either neutron rich or proton rich, depending on the, comp the, the, the different conditions. Uh, but I simply want to point out that we get a lot of ejected mass. That we run the simulation for about 400 milliseconds, and 20% of the initial torus is a, a bound. We can get even more if we were to run it for a second. Um, and so this is a major source of, of ejecta in these systems are the post-merger disks. In fact, I think it's the dominant one. Brandon, how much does this depend on what you assume about the spin of the black hole? It doesn't depend uh, overly strongly, but the spin is actually pretty well determined. So if you have two neutron stars that are slowly rotating, they almost always merge to create a spin of 0.7 or 0.8. So that's fairly uh, robust. It might be a little different in the case of a black hole neutron star. It, the higher spin tends to eject a little bit more mass, but it's, it's a small effect. Mostly this is just because these disks are radiatively inefficient. They can't cool and become thin disks that allow you know, all the gas to creep. A lot of it is, is, is unbound. They are cooled by neutrinos. Uh, okay. So as the matter expands into space, you can synthesize heavy elements. So this is just following a single fluid element as it's ejected from the merger. This is the temperature and density. Um, and what happens is, as the matter expands, all of the protons and some of the neutrons are very quickly through normal nuclear reactions captured into seed nuclei. This is the chart of the nuclei. This is proton number, neutron number. So you very quickly create these seed nuclei, but then you have so many neutrons left over uh, that they're able to build up to heavier elements by capturing neutrons and undergoing beta decays, capturing neutrons, beta decays. And so you can very quickly uh, create uh, the heavy elements this way. Uh, the seed nuclei form very quickly, but then they, the heavy elements build up over the time scale of about a second or so. So you're consuming neutrons, and then you, you get up to these heaviest elements, and then you run out of neutrons, um, and then everything slowly decays back to the stable valley. This is the stable valley of, of, of isotopes here. Over time scales of seconds, hours, uh, weeks. Okay. And eventually you end up with you know, whatever this particular fluid element produced in terms of its abundances. So for a neutron-rich fluid element with a very low electron fraction or high neutron-to-proton ratio, this is what you get. So this is the abundance versus the atomic number A. So you, you know the, uh, uh, the solar system abundances are shown as the dots, and, the, and the, the, the simulation is shown as the solid line. So you can actually, if you have very neutron-rich matter, you can actually get a pretty good fit to the second and third uh, R process. Uh, rap, so R process is rapid neutron capture nucleosynthesis peaks in terms of the solar system abundances. So the second peak is where, for instance, xenon and silver live around there. The third peak is where you have platinum and gold, and you can even through this process, create transuranic elements, assuming the matter is neutron rich enough. Um, okay. So the important point, though, for the kilonova is that this matter is, is radioactive. Um, so as it decays back to stability, it continually heats the material through a combination of beta decays, alpha decays, and fission. Um, so this is just the radioactive power as a function of time after the matter is ejected. Um, if I just had a single decaying nucleus like nickel-56 in, in a normal 1A supernova, I would have a constant radioactive heating followed by an exponential decay. But here I have you know, thousands of nuclei where one with a, a half-life of a second decays to one with a half-life of a minute decays.
case to one with a half life an hour. And when you add all the, the radioactive heat together, you actually get something that's more like a power law. It's actually closer to terrestrial radioactive waste in terms of the, the heating rate. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so, so most of the radioactive energy actually comes out at early times in the first second, but the ejecta is so opaque at that point, you don't see any of that energy. You have to wait for it to expand for about you know, several hours or a day before you can actually peer in and see all the energy that's being dumped in by the radioactivity. Um, so what really matters is the heating on this time scale of, of about one day. And, and in 2010, this was our big contribution, is we were the first to actually calculate this. Leon Pachinsky had this basic idea before 98, but they parameterized the heating, so they, they had heating up here or down here. They didn't really specify exactly how much energy is being uh, re released by radioactivity. And, and so we were able to actually quantify uh, how bright these things could be if, if the radiation can get out in one day. So this was our paper in 2010, where we just looked at a, a, a hundredth of a solar mass expanding at a tenth of the speed of light. Um, and the prediction was that about a day after, a little bit less than a day, we get up to uh, about a thousand times brighter than a classical nova, so we called them. Kilanova. And so after this event happened, uh, Philip uh, kindly made some bolometric light curves, and I just literally took, this was just the first plot in our paper, I just literally took this bolometric light curve uh, and plotted it over the data from this event. <laughs> so this was a pretty impressive religious moment for me uh, to see, see that you know, it worked out really well. You can almost even kind of see the radioactive decay right here. Um, but I want to emphasize this isn't the whole story. Uh, you know, this is a bolometric, this isn't fitting all the data, it's fitting bolometric data. Also, in this original model, even though we did consider thermalization effects, this model assumed 100% thermalization. In reality, it's, it's, some of the decay energy gets escapes in gamma rays and neutrinos, and so you, you get a lot, you know. So to explain the early data, you actually need more than a hundredth of a solar mass, a few hundredths of a solar mass. Uh, right. and I'll, yeah. <laughs> What's the bumpiness of the theoretical bumpiness? This one? Yeah. Okay, so that's another important point. So in this original model, we assumed iron opacity. And iron is initially in a doubly ionized state at early times when it's hot. And when it recombines, you get a jump in opacity. And it produces these, these secondary bumps. You see these in 1A supernova. We didn't see it in this event, because it's not made of iron. <laughs> uh, so there were, there, there, was, there were some issues. We didn't know what to assume as the opacities in these original models, since, since no one had ever tried to model these in the before. We felt we were doing enough adding the reactive heating. But the actual event had a very strong color evolution, which you, uh, well, many supernova evolve from blue to red, but, but, but even 1A's don't evolve as red as this one is. So this is not the whole picture. I just want to say, I do think we got a lot right in 2010. <laughs> uh, but, but, but the spectral evolution is very fascinating. So this is the, our, our group's optical uh, spectra here, and in the infrared spectra, um, so in early times, it was actually a very uh, featureless continuum, very fairly blue. Um, and this is because the matter is expanding very fast, so any of the lines are Doppler brought into way. You know, as time goes on, it cools, but about day 2.5, you start seeing what appear to be, you know, different spectral components. You start seeing something that appears to com come up in the infrared. And then, you know, after a few days, basically all of the flux is coming out in the infrared, and you see things that look even to late times like they're fairly uh, thermalish or sort of broad, broad, with broad absorption peaks and things in the near infrared. So this is very uh, fascinating because, it's, you know, anyways, 1A don't do, do this. Um, and you can also see this in terms of the photometric evolution. This is from, from Phil's original paper. So you can see that in the bluer bands, the thing faded very rapidly. But in the redder bands, you get a much uh, longer lasting emission. Uh, almost plateau-like for, for several weeks. Um, uh, okay, so how do we understand, you know, how this thing can be so blue and then become so red? You know, what, 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 is, what is the physics behind this? And so this really comes down to what elements we think are produced in the merger because, you know, the radioactive heating is heating the material but has to escape through the ejecta and what's preventing light from escaping are a forest of lines produced by whatever elements exist in the ejecta. So if you have, um, so this is the second R process peak here, and then this is the third one. And in between them uh, is the lanthanides, which are down here in their own. They're isolated because they don't fit in the periodic table. Um, so if you have the lighter R process elements, they have, you know, most of the lines are contributed by these half-filled D-shell valence electrons, uh, of things like iron, uh, elements that have half-shell, uh, half-filled valence cells, because those tend to have Many, comp you know, many ways you can rearrange the atom, and, uh, the electron in the atom, because they're half filled, and so you get many lines. And so iron tends to, to dominate the, 
the opacity of normal supernova. And it actually, a lot of the lighter R process elements we think have similar opacity to iron. But what Dan Kaysen and Tanaka and Hope Kazaka and Jenny Barnes point out is if you have just a small bit of lanthanides, they have F-shell valence electrons, so they have actually many more valence electrons. And so they have much more complicated atomic structure, many more lines in the optical and UV. And basically no light can get out of the optical UV if you have lanthanides. It all comes out in the infrared. I'm sort of simplifying, but, but essentially the, the basic idea is if you have iron or light R process nuclei, you can get something that is very similar to our original model, peaking on a day, fairly blue, blue colors. Whereas the prediction uh, from these works was if I have a, a bit of lanthanides in the ejecta, I'm in fact going to get something in the infrared. That it has to, the ejecta has to expand more for the radiation to get out because it has to be cooler, so it tends to come out uh, in the infrared. And it, importantly, the, the key thing is whether or not we have enough neutrons to get in our, in our process to get up to these elements. Okay. So if we just if we have a very low number of neutrons, we only produce the light R process elements, and we're going to get a blue kilonova. If we have more, we're also going to produce the lanthanides and have this persistent infrared emission. And in fact, the idea that we could get both an event was also pointed out before. So if we're sitting up here above the, the, the binary, um, we initially have, when the two neutron stars collide and merge, we initially have a dynamical phase of ejection. So we have matter that comes out in the equatorial plane, the tidal material. It's very neutron rich. It should produce uh, infrared emission. But when the neutron stars collide, they produce matter in the polar region, which, as I said, is radiated by neutrinos and doesn't tend to be as neutron rich. This matter probably doesn't produce the lanthanides. And so you can get blue emission from this component, potentially, and red emission from this component. Also, if you then have the accretion disk, which produces outflows, um, you know, depending on exactly what their composition of those outflows are, they could produce either the red or the blue emission. And so we could potentially see you know, both components in a single event, and that was sort of the prior that we had going into this event and, and, and why it kind of made sense as it unfolded. And, and so with the uh, Ashley and, and, uh, uh, and others, basically uh, James, they basically took the full uh, data set that was available after the discovery and modeled it in terms of this sort of two-component model where we have a blue, blue component of ejecta coming out at early times, and then a, a, a so-called red, or I'll call it purple kilonova for a reason I can talk about in a second. It just means higher opacity model, lanthanide laced material. Uh, so the blue kilonova we find is, is a few hundredths of a solar mass expanding quite rapidly. And the higher opacity component is a bit more mass, maybe three times as much expanding uh, slower. I call it purple because we infer that the opacity is not as high as we'd expect if there was a solar, solar fraction of lanthanides. Uh, but it does appear like we have to have some lanthanides in the ejector. We would not get this, this infrared continuum. Um, so anyway, so we have, I think, from the fact that we have some evidence for lanthanides and definitely the light R process elements, yeah, we're, we basically have, uh, I think, found, uh, I should say, at least an astrophysical site of the R process. I think it's probably the dominant one uh, based on this. So this is a mystery going back to Burbage, Burbage, Hoyle, Fowler, Cameron in the 1950s, where they pointed out that there were all these sites in nature where you could create all the heaviest elements, and the only site that they, the only process, nuclear process they identified, which didn't have its astrophysical site identified, was the R process. What we do know is that over the age of the galaxy to produce, they have the R process elements on average before the sun was, was formed, we need to produce about this many R process uh, 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 nuclei per year in terms of their mass. We now have a rate of binary neutron stars from LIGO, and so we can infer that whatever the site of the R process is, if we want it to come from neutron star mergers, each one of them has to produce a, between about a thousandth and, and a few hundredths of a solar mass, depending on whether you think LIGO got lucky or not in terms of the rates. Um, and with this event, as I mentioned, we, we model it, and we find that, that we have, uh, in some sense, more than enough. We have uh, several hundredths of a solar mass in total. Um, and so we have enough in principle, I think, to, to explain the galactic abundances of these elements. Um, and then if you break it down by what, you know, the, how much gold and platinum are produced in several Earth masses apiece, that's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, okay, but I, I do want to emphasize, though, to be completely fair, what we have evidence for is that there's some lanthanides, okay? It would take some fine-tuning not to produce lanthanides and not have any of the heavier elements like gold and platinum. Um, but that's what, you know, we don't really see lines of gold and platinum in the spectrum, but we're, we're sort of some extrapolation of our understanding. So then the question is, um, 
what, is, what are these different sources of ejecta that we see? These neutron stars slammed together, a bunch of mass was flying into space. What is it telling us about properties of neutron stars or what the fate of this system was? Um, so the first thing you'd like to explain is well, what is this high velocity blue emission, low lanthanide material that seems to come out first? But when I saw these high velocities, the first thing we thought of was, okay, this makes perfect sense if it comes from the dynamical ejecta because that's, that's what expands very quickly. And so when the two neutron stars collide together, you can get this cloud of material in the polar regions, which is shock heated. Um, the problem, if there is a problem, is that this is a lot of material, okay? A few hundredths of a solar mass. This is on the very upper end of what any simulation has ever seen. So this is a, a series of simulations by Andy Bousfein. This is the ejected mass uh, versus, uh, uh, and what he plots it is, is actually a function of the radius of the neutron star. So if you have a very large neutron star, it tends to not produce much shock heating, whereas if you have a smaller one, it tends to produce more. And this is just, it's just the fact that if you have smaller neutron stars of the same fixed mass, they, they can fall deeper in the potential well if the radius is smaller before they collide. And so the shock heating is stronger, and they tend to eject uh, more material. So if I take this literally, that I have to reproduce this much mass from the simulations, you can see that I'm being forced to a, a fairly small neutron star radius. You know, less than 11 kilometers, which would be very interesting. I wouldn't say we've, we, we are entirely sure this is the source of the blue ejecta. I mean, it's possible if I formed a long-lived remnant before it collapsed into a black hole, there may be, maybe it could have a magnetized wind, which is you know, getting to high velocities. There are some other explanations, but this is, you know, the natural one is that this could imply a small neutron star radius. Right? Yeah. The simulations, the mass ratios there were very good. Close. These are getting, so most of the matter is this polar material. That, that's, that's why I picked this plot. <laughs> so the, so the, most of this is not tidal material. It's, it's from the collision. Right. But I mean, the mass ratio for the, this right. one was maybe closer to 2 to 1, possibly, depending on the required. Well, we don't know. It could be it could be 1. We don't know for this event. It could be up to, up to I don't know, 2 to 1. Could, yeah. For, for the, it could be substantial. But if you have an asymmetric merger, it produces you know more tidal material, which doesn't tend to be to be blue. So so I think it's a fair comparison. Okay. I'm simplifying a bit, but but you can get more ejecta if it's asymmetric, but uh, it tends to not be of this blue. <laughs> and we don't see actually a lot of fast moving red and purple stuff. So I would say maybe we're having some evidence that the mass ratio is not enormous. So does that answer? Okay. Okay. Okay, well we can talk more. So what is this high uh, opacity component? Well I think it naturally, it could come from the tidal tails, but no simulation has ever gotten this much material in a tidal tail, and it's expanding too slowly. So to me, it makes perfect sense in terms of these accretion disk outflows, which I showed you the movie of earlier. Um, as I mentioned, we can get up to 40% of the torus being ejected, we estimate. Um, so if you start off with a tenth of a solar mass torus, which is not unreasonable, you can get this much material. Also, you tend to naturally get this velocity scale of about a tenth the speed of light. This is just the, the velocity, dis, uh, this is actually kinetic energy distribution, but this is the distribution from the output of our simulation is the green line, and the average velocity of what we see coming off the disk is about a tenth the speed of light. And this is set by basic physics. It's essentially the energy you release, the disk is formed of free nuclei, but as in the upper atmospheres of the disk where it gets cooler, those nuclei actually recombine into heavier elements, into alpha particles. Those alpha particles then synthesize heavier seed nuclei. And that tends to be what actually is like the afterburner that gives the disk winds their kinetic energy. And so you get this natural scale. If you just take 8 MeV per nucleon you get from forming heavy elements and equate that into a kinetic energy, it ends up being about a tenth the speed of light. So I think you can naturally understand this component as coming from fairly naturally, coming from the disk winds. But then the question is, well, what, well why? So, you know, uh, the other question is, well, okay, fine, if it comes from the disk winds, can we learn something about how long it took for the black hole to actually form? Um, so we were thinking about this several years ago, where we basically wanted to look at, um, uh, basically, so, so essentially we don't know a priori how long it's going to take for a black hole to form. It depends on the equation of state, how long differential rotation is required to remove. But what we want to do is to study the properties of the disk outflows as a function of the lifetime of the neutron star. So we have a neutron star in the middle. While it's, while it's still surviving, it strongly irradiates its environment by neutrinos, uh, particularly the polar regions. The matter that comes out tends to have a high electron fraction, tends to be 
uh, relatively neutron poor. Uh, whereas if you quickly form a black hole, you, you, you tend to get more neutron rich matter. And so this is just showing, we just ran a series of simulations of the disk. How much is ejected, how much is accreted, et cetera, as a function of the neutron star lifetime. And so this is our result for the distribution of the electron fraction. So this is how neutron rich the matter is. And what we found is that if the black hole forms very promptly, most of the matter comes out very neutron rich. But if the new black hole, if the new neutron star, sorry, if the neutron star lives longer and longer, more and more of the ejecta has a high enough electron fraction that it would not produce landonides. And so we, we tend to turn something that would be a very red kilonova from the disk winds into something that would become bluer and bluer with the lifetime of the neutron star. So if I squint my eyes and compare and say I want to get you know mostly blue emission here, uh, you know I can't have a neutron star lifetime longer than about 100 milliseconds. Uh, but we, we do need to think about this more because it, there is always a tail of neutron rich matter. So we may produce a little bit of landonides from some matter and if it got mixed with the rest we might be able to, to, to create a purple kilonova out of blue and red. And so, I need to think more about this actually, but I just want to say I think we're having some evidence that the neutron star did not survive very long because it would have turned this, this entire kilonova blue in, in, from the neutrinos. Um, okay, so let me just spend a little time talking about what the implications of this discovery are for the properties of neutron stars. So there's two things we'd like to know uh, about neutron stars, or I would like to know is what is their maximum mass? We have a very well measured mass, about two solar masses. But other than that, we don't really know how massive neutron stars can get. And the other question uh, is, what are their radii? So these are just you know, currently allowed equations of state of the neutron star, which predict radius as a function of mass. And you know, it, you know, for, ma for, for a typical 1.4 solar mass neutron star, what is its radius? And it can vary between about 11 and maybe 14 uh, or, or so uh, based on, on prior to this event. Right. If these plots, these lines, are for zero temperature. They are for zero temperature, yeah, yes. Temperature, you, you, do, you do heat things up. You do heat things up. There are corrections, yes. The, these are taken into account in the simulations, these corrections. But we still quantify everything in terms of the cold ELS. These corrections are actually fairly minor. They're, 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 they're not a perturbation, but they're not as, as strong as you'd expect. You heat matter up to 40 MeV or so, but it's not that hot relative to the relevant scale here. Yeah. But these are some of the things we might want to learn. So one of the things LIGO did was actually put an upper limit. So, so if you have strong tides between the neutron stars as they're merging, you can put energy from the orbital energy into tides, and, and that will show up as a, as, a, as a phase lag in terms of the gravitational waves or loss of phase. Um, and they don't see this in this event. And so they're actually able to put upper limits on the tidal deformability of the neutron star. And for a known mass, which we know fairly well in this system, this is a very strong function of the radius of the neutron star. Uh, and so this is this is the tidal deformability of one neutron star and the other, and then they sort of they sort of rule out anything up here. And this is the allowed region, um, uh, and so uh, so and then you, you you have some sort of combined combined one of these, which is a combination of these two, uh, which they're able to put some upper limit on. In any case, um, according to Jim Latimer, which I, I don't I haven't looked at this deeply myself. He claims that for realistic equations of state, this limit is actually very constraining and requires that the radius of a 1.4 solar mass neutron star be less than 13.5 kilometers. Uh, LIGO, I think, is actually going to update these constraints and they could become even stronger. The other implication uh, comes from the remnant that actually formed from this event. Uh, and this is focusing a little bit more on what the maximum mass of a neutron star is. So at the very beginning of this talk, I said how the outcome of the merger depends on two things. One is the total mass of the binary, which LIGO actually measures very well, and the other is the maximum mass of a neutron star. So, and so you have these four different possibilities for the merger outcome. You can immediately, if the mass of the, of the merger is very large, uh, so basically everything depends sensitively, everything sort of scales, these four different possibilities scale with the maximum mass of a neutron star. Um, so if, if, if the total mass of the merger is greater than about 30 to 60 percent of the maximum mass, then the object would immediately collapse into a black hole. Um, on the other hand, if the total merger remnant w were somehow less than the total ma than the maximum mass, then you would form an indefinitely stable neutron star. You basically take two neutron stars and make a, a third neutron star. We don't, we don't talk about it. We don't think that happened. Uh, uh, more likely is that you produce a differentially rotating uh, object which is temporarily supported by its differential rotation. This is a hypermassive neutron star. And that happens between about 20 and maybe 30 to 60 percent of the maximum mass. 
there's also a third, a fourth possibility, which is that once the differential rotation is removed, you create an object which is still rotationally supported by, by its solid body rotation. Uh, but once that is removed, once it spins down, it collapses to a black hole. Okay, so you have these four different possibilities. Um, and, and I'll discuss in a second, I think, that this event lies in the hypermassive neutron star range. But the point is that this is fixed, and then the e different equation of state will make different predictions for these different thresholds. Um, and so you can rule out different things. So for instance, um, we don't think you get a prompt collapse to a black hole because we would have got, not got this much kilonova ejecta. You might get some tidal tail material if the system is very asymmetric, but you wouldn't get any of this blue kilonova emission. And so this constraint actually uh, actually ends up, this, 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 this fraction here, the prompt collapse threshold actually depends on the radius of a neutron star. And so based on the fact that it didn't collapse, Andy Bausmeiner is actually able to put a lower limit on the radius of, of a a 1.6 solar mass neutron star of 10.3 kilometers, um, which, is, which is interesting. Um, but then the question is, okay, well, but could we have some, could we have created one of these rigidly rotating supermassive neutron stars or indefinitely stable objects? And the important thing to realize, so this would be this channel up here, which I discussed at the beginning of the merger. So if you did create a, a stable object, it's going to be rotating extremely rapidly because it, it has so much angular momentum from the merger. And all the simulations show that the magnetic field is amplified enormously by the merger process because there's an enormous amount of shear energy dissipated. You very easily amplify the magnetic field to at least 10 to the 16 gauss on small scales. And it seems likely to me there will be some dipole component. Okay, So you're basically creating inevitably a millisecond magnetar. And it contains an enormous rotational energy, 10 to the 50 or 10 to the 53 hertz. And the most likely mechanism that it's going to lose that rotational energy very quickly through, for instance, uh, magnetic dipole spin down in the form of a magnetized wind. And that, that, that is a quite an enormous luminosity, you know, 10 to the 49, uh, 50 ergs per second if we have a field that's of order the, the strength we expect in these objects. And so it will spin down then over a time scale of seconds and it will dump that energy into its environment. I actually studied this a long time ago with Niccolo Bucciantini, where we basically took the ejected cloud from a merger and we put a magnetar in the middle. You basically create like a, a miniature version of a pulsar wind nebula, but evolving very, very quickly, and, you know, minutes, uh, hours after the merger. And so you get two possible outcomes. If, if, the, if the magnetar is not spinning down super fast, or the ejected cloud is very massive, uh, the, basically the magnetar wind gets directed into a jet and this, this could be one way to produce X-ray emission we see after short gamma ray bursts. Some people have speculated that this could produce that if you had a long-lived magnetar. It's also possible that you, know, you could transfer this energy. So it turns out if the jet is more powerful, it tends to inflate a bubble very quickly in the ejecta and tends to, to shred the ejecta through sort of a Raleigh-Taylor uh, type instabilities. And then the, the emission may come out um, well, you definitely transfer most of the magnetar's energy in that case uh, to the kinetic energy of the material. I just want to emphasize, we see neither of these in this case, okay? We didn't see any extended X-ray emission from this event. And we certainly don't infer that there's 10 to the 52 ergs of energy in the kilonova. The kinetic energy of the kilonova is more like 10 to the 51 that we infer from our model. So I don't think we have any evidence that this happened in this event. And, the, and my student, Ben, quantified this more precisely for given equations of state. We just quantified how much rotational energy would need to be extracted to cause the object to collapse to a black hole. Uh, but how much energy would be extracted before it would collapse to a black hole? Um, and then we basically demanded that that be less than what we have from the electromagnetic observations. And this ends up, if you fold all this through, it ends up allowing you to put an upper limit on the maximum mass of a neutron star. Uh, I don't, you know, coming back to that original, uh, original slide. Uh, I don't want to go into too many details on the exact methodology, but basically, if the maximum mass were too large, the merger would have produced one of these, these beasts which would have dumped an enormous amount of rotational energy into the environment. So we find actually that this, that the fact that we didn't do these actually puts an upper limit which is quite constraining, maybe 2.2 solar masses, okay. Um, so, so we already know that the maximum mass is greater than about two from the, the pulsar. So this is really becoming uh, constraining on the maximum mass if this is true. Um, so anyways, I just want to come back to this plot of the equation of state of the neutron star and talk about all of the things that this event has taught us. Uh, well, one thing is, uh, so from Andy Bausfein, no prompt collapse. We need to have a radius greater than about 10.3. 
from the, the, the non-detection of tidal uh, effects, we need a radius less than about 13.5. And then according to Ben and I, we need a maximum mass less than about 2.2. Uh, and so there's already, you know, only a you know, limited number of these equations of state which are still uh, all consistent with this event. And if you also take the fact that we need this blue kilonova, if you think it is dynamical object, and, 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 and then you're basically forcing down here, and, and the, the allowed parameter space is like one equation of state. So this is just showing, I'm not saying, you know, all these methods have their, their systematics and their uncertainties, we're going to need more events, but I was just amazed by how this, this single event is, is is already really you know, pushing into uh, these types of questions that we thought would take many events or, or might not be addressable. Okay, um, so let me just spend a little bit of time talking about the future. So we think this event, you know, I'll come back to this, it seems to make some sense. Uh, uh, you know, there's some, still some outstanding questions, but let's talk about what is the next word you're going to look like. You know, probably it's going to look completely different. So I just want to talk a little bit about some of the realistic diversity we might expect in the Kilanova. Because once uh, LIGO turns on in 03, we don't know exactly the rates of these mergers, but they should detect a few of these, I would think. And once we reach design sensitivity, uh, it's expected to detect about 10 to 100 of these every year. Okay, so we're going to be seeing these mergers from different angles. We're going to be seeing them with different masses of the initial neutron star going in, which could produce different qualitative outcomes. Um, so I want to get a little bit ahead of that by, saying, by talking a little bit about some of the things we can see. So one thing is we might not be so fortunate to see this event within 30 degrees of the axis. If we do have this fast expanding equatorial tidal tail, which is very neutron rich, it will basically, uh, it, it could block the blue component of the emission if we're viewing this event in the equator. So I don't know if it will completely block it because our original ideas were that the blue component wouldn't be expanding so rapidly. So the, the tidal material would completely block it, but now we know the blue material is expanding at 0.2 or 0.3 C. We might still be able to see some of it peering out, you know, uh, peering out of the top. Um, but I still think we should expect, you know, red emission for equatorial viewers. I think that's probably a generic statement. Uh, we also expect, as I mentioned, the amount of blue versus red emission com uh, outflows coming from the accretion disk depends on the lifetime of the neutron star. And the lifetime of the neutron star depends inversely on the mass of the binary coming in. It takes longer to collapse if you have a less massive object. So we would generically expect the amount of red versus blue emission to change with the mass lifetime of the neutron star. So if I get a very prompt collapse, most of the emission will be red. And then if I get a neutron star that survives longer, or equivalently a smaller binary mass, we could get a stronger blue component relative to the red one. So this is something we should be able to test, because LIGO will tell us the total mass, and we will look and see. Uh, what we see electromagnetically. If we had been fortunate enough to not have to wait 11 hours to detect this event, but if we had gotten on in the first hours, it's possible that it would have been even brighter than what we observed. I mean, not, you know. um, so this is so. So one way this can happen is, um, so the, when the neutron stars collide, you eject matter uh, uh, out of the system. Most of it is fairly slowly expanding and creates the R process just as I described to you. But there may be a small component of matter which is expanding very fast, so fast that the neutrons don't have time to be captured into nuclei. They, the, the R process essentially freezes out for maybe the outer 1% of the ejecta. And you say, well, why do I care? Well, what, what, why you care is because neutrons have a long half-life of about 15 minutes. So they dump their energy in more gradually, and it's less susceptible to adiabatic losses. So on a time scale of actually a few hours, the, the addition of extra neutron heating in the outer layers makes a significant difference on the light curves. Um, and this, this was one example where just showing the, the difference of, of, especially in the bluer bands relative, this was of course relative, I think, to a lanthanide only model, so, so it seems even more extreme, if I remember. Um, but in any case, it's, it's possible we could see signatures of these free neutrons if they exist in the outer layers in the first few hours. And it's also the, this outer 1% uh, it matters because that's also the, the depth to which you're, you're viewing in the, in the first few hours. Because as time goes on, you're viewing deeper in, and so the, the, this outer neutron rich skin is what you see first. I should say that there, after this paper on neutron precursor, there's been a lot of discussion of the so-called cocoon which is when the jet shocks this cloud of material, that could also produce early blue emissions. So if we see this, uh, we'll have to fight about who's right. 
in terms of whether it's free neutrons or cocoon emission powering this um, early emission. But anyways, but the point is we would need to get on within an hour. This event actually took several hours for LIGO to disseminate the, the coordinates. Uh, 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 but in principle, they should be able to do it in minutes. And so if we have an opportunity positioned telescope, we can get on there. I was just going to say, yeah. There's, so, so if you see this early blue emission, I'm sure the cocoon people will say they're right and not say I'm right. Um, okay. And then, okay, well, maybe we will, and then I, I already mentioned this, but maybe we will see these very low mass binaries which create, you know, magnetars, and maybe they don't make gamma ray bursts. I don't think we, we know yet. Uh, uh, maybe they, but they could produce much brighter uh, uh, optical and extra emission because you have an additional energy source other than radioactivity. Um, so you create this nebula around the new object, uh, around the object, kind of like a miniature pulsar wind nebula. You create a bunch of x-rays. Those x-rays can either be absorbed by the ejecta and reprocessed into optical infrared emission, um, or they could ionize the ejecta if they're powerful enough and escape directly to the observer. And so we might see substantially brighter optical and x-ray emission on timescales of a few days if um, we have these so magnetars, which again require very low mass binaries that survive for a long period of time. Uh, the final thing I'll say is that I didn't don't want to talk too much about this, but this event was, um, was, was used uh, to do a little bit of cosmology, as you probably heard, by combining the gravitational wave distance with the Hubble flow velocity of the galaxy. Uh, basically, gravitational waves, um, uh, uh, you know, basically you can, you have, you have sort of a, a standard uh, ruler of sorts because the gravitational waves, uh, uh, you know, how, how bright they are depends on, on, on the distance. Um, and, and so you can use this to actually to place a constraint on the Hubble constant, uh, basically creating a Hubble flow diagram of gravitational wave. Um, in any case, as you probably saw, the constraints of the Hubble constant are, are sort of, you know, broadly consistent with those, uh, the competing Planck versus supernova groups. Uh, um, so this event alone is not really resolving that discrepancy, but we're going to have more of these. We'll be able to, to do this better. And again, we'll have, you know, up to 100 of these per year after distances of 200 megaparsecs. And this kill level was actually quite bright, so I just want to point out that it was reached about R of 17 or so at 40 megaparsecs. Um, so, you know, even at 200 megaparsecs, if we see the same type of thing, smaller telescopes could get in on the action. Uh, for things that are maybe a bit further away, because this is just the average distance LIGO sees. Uh, uh, there will be some events that are further away. There will be black hole neutron star mergers we could see further away. Um, you know, for 500 megaparsecs, we could still see these things with dark energy camera. And then if we imagine the future, you know, LIGO is considering realistic upgrades on sort of <coughs> decade timescales, five-year timescales, which could uh, substantially enhance the sensitivity, well, enhance the sensitivity by another, you know, by another factor of two, to where, you know, with black hole neutron star systems, they could imagine even seeing these things out to the gigaparsec distances. So if black hole neutron stars were to create similar transients to this event, we could even possibly detect them with LSST. And then we could do this type of thing even for other cosmological parameters than uh, the Hubble constant. I don't want to speculate too much on this, but I think this is important to think about going ahead as we, as we plan these Okay, so that's basically what I want to finish. I just want to conclude by saying we're certainly still debating aspects of this event. I, but to me, the most surprising thing was how well behaved the event was. Uh, we, basically, almost everything that we saw, uh, we, we in some ways either were theoretically predicted uh, or had been seen before and, and observationally characterized. Okay, so, so, so we saw the gravitational waves, great. We saw a gamma ray burst. It was a bit dimmer than a normal gamma ray burst, actually quite a bit dimmer. Uh, but, you know, the, the properties were not ridiculous in terms of what we expect from short gamma ray bursts. Um, you know, this idea of an orphan afterglow if you're off axis of the jet was also theoretically expected where we saw the emission rising a few weeks afterwards. So the idea is, okay, let me just go through this again. So the neutron stars merge, they collide, this produces quite a bit of fast ejecta. It has a fairly high electron fraction, so it, it doesn't produce the heavy star process elements. It produces mostly lighter ones. Then you form a, a hypermassive neutron star with an accretion disk, which you know, fairly quickly, we think, maybe 100 milliseconds or so, collapses into a black hole. The accretion disk powers a jet, which breaks through this blue kilonova ejecta, goes out to some large distance, and makes the gamma ray burst. And then as the jet interacts with the interstellar medium, it slows down and produces the Arfan extra afterglow, which, which we saw. 
Um, and then, you know, about a day later, the, the low opacity material becomes transparent and we see the blue kilonova and then the more equatorial or spherically symmetric uh, uh, higher opacity material, which also produce the heavier elements, uh, maybe up to golden uranium, uh, produces this, this infrared emission. Uh, and so, so that's, I think, you know, and, and the way I say this is sort of, you know, when I heard, first heard from Ido, okay, we discovered this thing in the optical, I'm like, okay, you're looking in the infrared red because the thing's going to become red. And then, you know, we didn't detect the X-ray as a radio, but we're like, okay, we need to keep monitoring this because we know that we'll eventually see the off-axis afterglow because we know we're pretty close to the axis. So that's what I mean as well behaved, is that there was, there was nothing that was sort of, as this thing was unfolding, we sort of guessed what the next stage was. And I'm hoping the next one will be more surprising in that regard. So I'm just going to just put my conclusion up there and, uh, and finish next. Thanks. Thank you. Time for a few questions. Yeah. Well, yeah. um, so it's a source of gold and, and uranium. It's the source of all evil, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I know. That's that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's probably not the best things to highlight. I think Bob Kirster said this. You guys are like the elements of greed or something. Is he? The question is: uh, There aren't many of these in the galaxy. Of these mergers in our galaxy. Yeah during its lifetime, so is there enough mixing or do we expect huge variations in the balance? That, is, that's the, that was one of the main original objections to mergers was that if you go to metal core stars, you see that there are some stars that are highly enriched in these. One question is, do they happen early enough in the chemical evolution history? I mean, definitely as you go back to low iron, I'm not the best person to speak about this to other people here, but as you go back to low metallicity stars, they definitely show a greater variation in abundances of these elements relative to iron. But the question was always, is, is that, is, you know, um, is that variation, I mean, in some ways people were arguing the opposite, that the variation would have been even larger, <laughs> you know, if you had, if you had these neutron star mergers. But now, you know, we do have a number of, of indirect pieces of evidence that whatever is making the R process is a rare uh, event. One of them comes from uh, plutonium on the ocean floor, you may have heard this argument, so, so, you know, uh, we see iron 60 on the, on the ocean floor, which is produced in supernova. If neutron star mergers were continuously going off and being well mixed in the galaxy, we'd expect a certain amount of plutonium, and we don't see as much as we'd expect. So people have inferred that whatever is making the, the plutonium, it's, it's a much rarer event than a standard core collapse supernova. We have on a Freeville's work on reticulum 2 showing that there is like half the stars in the reticulum 2 have very few R process or no R process elements, and then there's a few that have a whopping large amount. I mean, they estimate how large of a pollution event they need, and a single supernova wouldn't do it, but a, a neutron star merger you know, would. <laughs> so I think we're getting, we're having hints from other directions that the R process site is rare. Uh, but there is, I think there is a, still a question as, as to whether the chemical evolution can, can be worked out. It's just, it's just hard to resolve all this mixing in the, in the galaxy simulations, <laughs> is my understanding. So it's actually hard to go from that, directly from that and say, you know. But it would be nice to combine it and work the simulations. Yeah, I think, yeah, there's definitely work, work along these lines, yeah. Right, once you have a distribution of sources where you see work that are located in all these galaxies, these are very close, very close to the galaxy, very close to kiloparsecs. <clears throat> but from short tier means we find something that, you know, like 100 kiloparsecs or further away from the galaxy, so maybe that material doesn't get mixed in. That's in a similar way. So I, I think it would be nice to have a distribution and then fold that in. Yeah, yeah, very nice, yes, yes. And, uh, you know. And we also have to know better, you know, we're arguing with the purple kilonov exactly how many lanthanides, how many of the heavy R process elements are being produced here. And, and um, well, if we can figure that out and we can multiply by the rate, we'll have a better idea for how well we're producing the solar system. Uh, maybe time for one more. Peter? Do you have a uh, preferred installation for the 1.7 second delay? And uh, do you see a way to, to figuring out what about this? Um, I don't. I know a lot of theorists like the idea that it's a delayed time. Well, there's there's two things that, I, that, that people tend to like, but um, um, I, one thing I didn't like in, in, until recently was this idea that it was the time it takes the black hole to form, uh, because I thought 1.7 seconds is way too long. If I look at you know the I look at my models here that even last for 300 milliseconds, I wouldn't expect any of the kilonova, very little of the kilonova to, to, be, uh, to, be, to be red. Uh, but there is this tale of, of neutron-rich matter 
And if I create a little bit of lanthanides and mix it with the rest of this material somehow, maybe I could get a, a purple enough kilonova. So, so I, I originally didn't like the idea that, that a black hole could have taken a second to form, but now I, I don't know. Um, so that's one possibility. Um, the other one is that, as I mentioned, that if, 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 if the gamma ray mission site is very far away from the engine, um, there, there can just be an extra travel time delay. So you, so you have the jet go out and it makes the gamma rays and then it takes an extra bit of time to get there. Uh, uh, but, but, but I know some people that don't like that. <laughs> so I don't know. It's, it's, it's definitely some, probably the most, one of the most hotly debated things right now. So I think that's all the time we have right now. Brian will be giving a talk at the luncheon as well. Let's thank Brian again.